Hello everyone, Angelo here. Homeless filmmaker, been in Los Angeles for six months. I'm in my new Toyota Camry, a 2000 Toyota Camry. I was uh, reading Jackie Chan's new autobiography, Never Grow Up. Got it right here. And I'm about halfway through it, almost. I love Jackie Chan movies. I I love the uh, sort of the comedy and the action, all that stuff, and the incredible energy to his performances. And I read his first autobiography, My Life in Action, and uh, I knew some of it. It's I like his first one a lot, but it's kind of too storybook. Some things that happen, and sure enough, he tells like the real versions of stuff that happened, even though. I don't think this book's that good so far, and I don't think it's gonna get much better, never grow up, that is, because it's like he just glosses through everything. There's no getting into the personal details. In his first one, he goes into a lot more details, but one story in particular, different account of how it happened than the much more storybook thing. Anyways, but I got thinking about reading this book. For some reason, it just made memories of when I was a bouncer come back to me. Not anything to do with the fighting, but that's what this video is about, the fighting and the crazy experiences and, and the loneliness of it. But I was thinking, I don't know, I guess I, it got me thinking if I was going to tell a story about myself, I would want to go deep and get into the emotions and how it make me feel. Whereas in Never Grow Up, he just kind of skips through a lot, so it's like he's pushing the audience away. Anyway, so I was a bouncer for five years, five and a half years in Northern Virginia. Worked at a couple different bars, three different ones, uh, but really the main one I worked at for those five and a half years is where these experiences come from. First of all, it was a lonely job. Um, oh yeah, how did I get the job? Well, I literally went around just up and down the streets just asking if anyone needed a bouncer and I lucked out. This one, they said, yeah, we need someone coming tomorrow. And I asked a bunch of places, but, um, and every bouncer job I got, it was through it, that was the only one where I just walked in and got it. The other two were through people I knew. And uh, I got the job in the first place because even though I was a videographer before that and I wanted to be a filmmaker, um, I went through that whole time where I was sick, I was disabled for nine months, completely incapable of working. And uh, I got back into videography, but I really didn't feel like myself yet and I needed to make money for sure. So videography wasn't enough. And I thought I need to do something, something, you know, where I'm like doing some kind of uh, challenging or stressful work, but I cannot deal with customers. I don't want to deal with them. And I thought, well, I'd rather fight drunks than have to be nice to them uh, as a server. So that's when I started looking to be a bouncer. And also it was nice to work nights, you know, not have to deal with, uh, performance reviews, all that corporate nonsense. Just do my job, do a simple task. So the job is mostly boring, it was lonely, I'll get into all that. A lot of just checking IDs at the door, otherwise just standing around watching people, watching for fighting, for outside drinks, for drugs, for people passing out. Um, first real fight I got in there, it wasn't even much of a fight for me, I just got jumped. Uh, Super Bowl 2014, two guys were harassing two other guys, and it was kind of going on for a little while, and they would back off and then go mess with them again, so I went up to them, told them to leave them alone, and I, here I am thinking, oh, I could just be nice about it, we can talk like friends, and one of the guys stepped around behind me, boom, sucker punched me. I didn't even know I got punched. I saw a flash of white, and I literally, and I, you know, it was hard to react, and I literally thought, uh, like, oh no, am I, I, I thought, am I dying? Like, am I having a stroke? What's going on? I'm lucky that guy couldn't punch worth shit. They were both drunk and high, and uh, they, the other friend punched me a little bit, knocked me back, the bus boy, it was a pretty slow night. It was after the Super Bowl was over. Um, uh, dishwasher, good guy, jumped over the counter to try and help me and uh, they punched me two or three more times and that was that. And my nose bleeds so easily. So every time I get punched in the head, I get a nosebleed. And I don't even realize it. I look down, I'm like, oh crap, I'm bleeding. I got blood on my phone and stuff. Um, police came, I went to the hospital. I ended up being there half the night. Somebody actually died in the hospital while I was there. Guy connected to tons, it's like all tubes all over. And then they went out and notified a woman 
in the waiting room that he, he died and she said oh no what am I gonna do now um, and I was just waiting there that night and uh, you know my car was in the parking lot at my job so and one of my co-workers they had to move it to the other side of the lot it was a very small lot but um, certain spots were there for businesses in the mornings and then at night we had the whole parking lot so uh, I gave her my keys to move it and um, I ended up just walking a mile back in the rain to the job and so when it opened I was able to get my car keys back my boss gave me a free meal so I got the most expensive one I could and uh, I gave the police all the info their names people knew who they were where they worked everything their pictures on Facebook I found them police never did anything now usually the police were pretty good about responding and helping us out I ended up being a witness a couple times in court or one time I didn't even have to show up in court I think I'm trying to I can't remember keep them all straight but um it's not like there was a ton of fighting at this bar it was pretty laid back most people you know they're just there to have fun it's not like there's a ton of stuff going on, not necessarily a ton of hookups or anything wild shit. There were guys in there. Man, these guys always trying to go hook up with women every week. And, you know, if they weren't, didn't get lucky one night, they'd try it again. And a bunch of people, there was always a crowd there who, af after the end of the night, they would go to the MGM Grand in Maryland and go gambling. Uh, the casino there. It was pretty boring the most for the most part. Lonely. You know, I'm broke my mind was still not all together after my nine months of disability and the the disability the nature of it was basically I just became psychotic I went insane I was hallucinating um, compulsively pacing for 23 hours a day for one period of that not all nine months but like about a month I think and uh, it was really painful and even for the next year after I stopped being sick I still could not sleep more than three or four hours a night that was torture uh, worrying I'll never sleep a full night again. Thankfully after about a year I could sleep a full night it, it was so bad that I couldn't even take a nap when I was brutally exhausted I don't know how I got through that and I, It seems like ever since then I can fall asleep a lot more quickly and I get tired a lot more quickly But then again, I always needed a lot of sleep We had an incident one night this guy Actually, I met him a few weeks before I remembered him I forget exactly why I talked to him. It was early in the night, the, the sun was still up, and he was sitting at a booth uh, right by where I was working the door, and for some reason, I don't know, I said something to him like, oh, you can't bring your drink outside or something. And he's like, oh, okay, cool, and he started talking to me a little, and um, talking about, uh, I think he was talking about like, racism or something how racist it is for uh you know what uh black men have to go through or something and he talked about being in prison in california and he seemed a little distressed like a little off but i was commiserating with him i was like yeah that's true you know whatever i forget exactly the conversation but i always remembered that then weeks later i remember there was some big redskins game and this guy was like really exuberant celebrating and it was weird he would show hostility in his celebrating meaning he would go up to some guy he met at the bar that night and like stare him down like he was dead serious wanted to kill him and then just grab him and hug him and then towards well not towards the end of the night later in the night he was uh outside some people you know they're out there smoking and um I th he was bothering some lady and she said, yeah, this guy's telling me uh, he, he wants me to be his woman and stuff, and wants ask, asking if I want to buy weed from him. And, you know, I have to, uh, went over to him, and I had to kind of, you know, diffuse it and make it, let him know, like, because he was acting all agitated. She was calm. And I had to let him know, because he was getting all agitated, so I'm trying to calm him down and, like, sort of take his side, but just so he'll listen to me. Like, hey, man, if she's bothering you, just leave her alone. If she's not, you know, she wasn't bothering him. He was getting mad because he he, he wanted to bother other people. But she, uh, I, I said, just leave her alone. Forget it, man. It's not worth it. And he was like, what? What? You want to check me? I'm like, no. What are you talking about? He's like, you want to check me? Unzipped his jacket. A big old pistol right there. That thing must have been at least 30 caliber strapped to his waist. So I'm like, okay. I walked back into the bar, ran up to the bartender, yelled, call the police. Guy's got a gun outside and stuff. I went back up to check what was going on to the front windows, looked out. This guy was pointing this gun at this woman's head. 
and I was like, oh shit. Like I was just looking and he was holding it there and I went to the door. I kind of don't know what I was thinking. That, well, no, I had to do this in a way and I just kind of peeked my head just barely at the door. I couldn't even really see him. I just kind of had my head by the door so if he shot the door, he would have hit me. But I said, hey man, get out of here, go, go. And he started running and the weird thing is too, there was this homeless guy who had mental problems on the street and he wasn't doing anything really. And then he started running too, like with the other guy, but he, he had nothing to do with it. So here's the really funny part. And thank goodness he did not hurt anyone. Oh my goodness. We called the cop. Cops were all over the neighborhood, dogs, everything. They were coming back looking at security footage. So we didn't have security footage of the gun being out, but at least I could show you know him on camera. And so this is what he looked like because he was in the bar. An hour later, this guy just walks in calmly, the guy who had the gun. He just stops, looks around, and I see him walk up, and I, I don't want to run at him, because if he's still got a gun on him, I don't want him to pull it out and shoot me. So I wait for him to walk up to the bar. He walks past me. I immediately grab him, locked his arms behind him, and most of the cops had left by this point, but I was yelling for the bartender, and the DJ uh, came over, and I said, I say, go get the cops, get the, go get the cops, this is the guy. And he's, he's playing dumb, he's like, what, what? He's like, what's going on? It turned out he left his cell phone in the bar. <laughs> I think he also left a watch, too, and I uh, gave that to the police, but um, yeah, he came back for his phone. So uh, then the police came and arrested him, and... Um, I think they sentenced they ended up sentencing him to like 12 months in jail for brandishing a firearm they couldn't get him for more because they didn't actually find the gun he ditched the gun a couple other fights here and there you know the amazing thing about a fight two in a bar it's it, it almost like is in a movie in a way how a fight can happen in one part of the bar and 15 20 seconds later you know the thing's over this happened once okay I was taking IDs at the door. These two, these people at the door were saying, hey, those guys look like they're going to fight. I looked over, and I was kind of too nonchalant because I'm used to people just arguing, whatever, and I thought, oh, they must be overreacting. Sure enough, I'm checking their IDs, and then I look over, they're fighting. So I ran over. The other bouncer ran over. We try and pull them apart. By the time the thing was done, it only, you know, only took like 15, 20 seconds. So many people had ran and scattered. There was food at the other end of the bar, plates and drinks knocked over. I'm like, how the fuck did that get knocked over all the way at the under, other end of the bar? People were running everywhere. So it really does kind of happen like in movies, just everybody panics. Um, not all the time, you know, the same way every time, but man, uh, yeah, that can happen. I've gotten in, a, a lot of fights for me happened at the door. Either I was trying to kick someone out who was being an asshole and they wouldn't want to leave and they would start shoving me or threatening me or whatever or I wouldn't let them in because they weren't allowed in I'd already been in near fights with them before this happened a couple times and um, in one case the guy was there and uh, never had problems with him before and this time people say he was like talking crazy and and saying scary stuff or something and he was already drunk so when he tried coming back in I said you can't come back in you know people said they were concerned or whatever I said I don't even remember and he's like man you better let me in or I'll I forget what he said I'll burn this place down or something whatever and I was just like come on just go outside and he's like man I'll slit your fucking throat and he was reaching into his pocket <laughs> And I thought he might have a nice knife, and I'm still trying to defuse him a little bit. And finally, whatever, I think he threw the first punch or something, I'm not sure. He and I start punching each other, and that's when I broke my pinky, my left pinky. It's fine now, I think. I haven't really thought about it in a long time, but uh, man, it hurt like a motherfucker. I punched him, and uh, anyway, so by the end of that fight, people were watching, like noticing what was going on. And uh, he just left, he was scared. Because uh, I think, yeah, the bartender was gonna get ready to call the cops or something. We try not to call the cops, you know, we don't call them for every fight. Try and let people just go if they'll just leave, you know, unless it was like a injury or something or, um, you know, serious assault. But, you know, they could call the cops if they want, but we wouldn't do that unless, because a lot of times when people are fighting, it's two people who are agitating to fight. It's not like it was just one. Um, you know, most most of the time it should just be talked down or can be talked down. It, it's always stupid when people fight. Always a failure. I never liked doing it because I never liked hitting anyone. I don't respect people. There's nothing fair about a fight. When you hit someone, it's because they're vulnerable. 
they're they're got some weakness where you could get in a punch so I never liked that. Also, you never know what kind of condition someone's body is in. You don't know if a punch will kill them, will fracture their skull, will cause an aneurysm or something. You don't know. So, you know, some people are, don't have any fear about that. I always worried about that. Especially some of these people, you know, you don't know what kind of health they're in. Especially if they're, they're drinking a lot, they could have really bad health. So, uh, my pinky was broken. I didn't know it for like a day though. Because I was like, oh, it just hurts like hell. And the next night, it was so fucking swollen, this pinky. And it was hurting so bad. I was like, motherfucker, I can't take this. I went to the emergency room. They x-rayed it. They said it was broken. They're like, and it was funny. The way it was chipped, um, the doctor was like, yeah, I don't even know how you broke it this way. I'm like, I don't know either. Like, shit. I, I didn't notice the moment when it broke. When I hit him in the face or I don't know. I fist deflected off something, what? But um, also, it was kind of pointless to go to the hospital because nothing they could do, they put it in a little splint, which made it hard to, oh man, it hurt when I bumped my pinky into anything, especially the turn signal. Pinky, it's weird how big it gets when you have just a little splint on it and bumping into the turn signal, into doors and stuff. You don't, no like, you don't notice the extra size and it hurt like a motherfucker, but there was nothing really they could do, just, you know. They recommended I go to some other doctor. I called back and canceled, because I'm like, what's the point? They're not gonna do anything. We had several bad uh, cops, military or military police. One guy was supposedly an FBI agent, the FBI agent, real asshole. Uh, supposedly had a gun and um, him and his douchebag friends were like didn't want him to leave and or didn't want to leave and he didn't want to leave so we couldn't really argue with him because he's got a gun so we called the police and they made him leave um, he was just drunk and being rude and asshole and he, he wouldn't listen to anything so we had to tiptoe around that real carefully if he's got a gun on him uh, funny how you're in the FBI you don't get in trouble for that being drunk with a gun in a bar he didn't pull it out or anything, but one of the bartenders noticed it when he like leaned over or something. And his friends were assholes too, like, oh no, he shouldn't have to leave, man. It's cool, like, man, I swear, a lot of law enforcement don't give a shit about human life. We've had several groups of cops in there just be assholes. He's, they're like a gang. Um, bullies, uh, we had some, I remember close to when I quit, complaining like, when I said, all right, guys, you know, I always do my last call and procedure. We're very strict about it because it's the law and stuff, and we got to make sure people aren't staying and drinking too much. So, you know, I would say, last call, whatever. you got 10 minutes, finish your drinks, five minutes, and countdown. Now I'm like, all right, guys, we're closed. Finish your drinks now. We're going to take them. And these guys were whining, and one of them was like, yo, like, yeah, last call is actually 3 o'clock, not 2. I didn't even bother arguing because what's the point? I've been there for five years. I knew when last call was. And he's like, okay, we're just law enforcement, though. Like, this whiny victim mentality that uh, I, I can't understand how a person can have. Where it's like, you must dominate others and you're seeking their approval, but you believe you're superior to them. Fuck that. I had one cop, one drunk cop, uh, get in an argument with the guy. Literally right in front of me, pull out his taser. Not a stun gun, a taser, you know, that shoots the barbs. And uh, is, has wires that... um send the electricity through and uh let me roll up the window he was arguing with this guy right in front of me pulled it out and i didn't even think to fight him because I, I, I didn't want to grab him either or anything i was just like man put that down what's wrong with you and he put it down and left we called the cops and the cops didn't find him he left somewhere had another group of military guys uh, apparently they were mourning the loss of one of their friends and um bunch of them came in no problem but then one of them was out in the street drinking a beer mug that I didn't know if he got from inside because I didn't think he was in our bar first but he got from another bar and he's drinking I'm like hey you can't come in here he's like fuck you and uh he just kind of walked right in I didn't want to fight him right there and I argued with him said you can't be here he's like look look let me explain and then he explained the whole thing I'm like all right fine but you can't drink in here I see him drink one cocktail let it go he drinks another say you can't and he's arguing and arguing, and he's like, man, we're, we can beat the shit out of you. We can kick your asses. I said, well, look, we're going to call the cops if you, if you don't leave. And he's like, we are the police. Just whiny little uh, shit. And uh, finally, he did leave, he and his friends, when we called the cops. And by the time the cops came, like, he was already getting in a, whatever, a ride share and left. But yeah, a lot of shitty cops, cop mentality. Man, just, you don't want to hang around them. They're, you fucking... <laughs> serve and protect and they wonder why people don't like them 
uh, these guys are just bullies. Um, they want, they seem to enjoy violence, um, seem to want to, you know, dominate others. Uh, a lot of them are domestic abusers. Um, and a lot of them I can absolutely believe are domestic abusers. If that's how you treat someone out in public, uh, when you have witnesses around and who can defend themselves, how would you react when you're at home with someone, with a child or with a woman who are scared of you? So, not surprising. Uh, other little things, but not, again, not, overall not a ton of fights. The other thing I wanted to talk about though, being a bar in Northern Virginia, you know, it's funny. I grew up conservative. A big thing that helped make me no longer be conservative, drive me away from that, was just being around a lot of conservative culture of Confederates, of uh, these fucking racist assholes come in just ranting about. Now, I didn't, it's not like I heard this a ton, but it, a lot of this shit of like, you know, this kind of little stuff they weave into conversation about black people, about immigrants, gay people. Um, we had this one guy, I fucking hate, he was always a mean son of a bitch. For some reason, he thought a transgender man was in the bathroom or something, and which would be totally fine. And then he's like, man, people don't know which bathroom to go to these days. What's wrong with that? I, he thought that. I, I, for, I think actually all that happened, uh, a woman snuck into the men's room to use the bathroom because the line was too, there was too much of a wait or something. For some reason, he got it mixed up and he was thinking that I wanted to tell him like it's none of your business or something, something like that. I didn't bother. This guy was a massive motherfucker, man. But a lot of uh, just dealing up close with like, it was just sickening. Confederates, people with, you know, the Confederate gear and stuff. Not always the Confederate flag, not a ton of that, but all kinds of other symbols and and stuff related to that and their little clubs and groups. It was just sickening. Sickening to be around that mentality, that culture, that air, this slaveholder culture. You know, once, uh, I remember one time I, from this big mean son of a bitch at another bar I worked at in Northern Virginia, uh, just always angry and um, started complaining to me about how he does business with uh, Indians and Jews. And then he told me, he's like, I don't know if you're Jewish. And then he started going into his rant. <laughs> Um, people in hunting gear, uh, you know, like the orange vests. And we had white supremacists, prominent white supremacists that you've seen in the news come in. I don't even want to say their names because they don't deserve names. I can't describe how much I despise them. Made me sick to see them in there. It was always uncomfortable. People didn't like it. Couldn't really say shit because, you know, the owner didn't want to say anything. The owner was super, you know... They didn't want conflict, but... It, and it just made me so sick. And they left the sickest notes in the bathroom. They're cowards. They'll go to a bar where immigrants work, where brown people work, black people, people who speak other languages, and yet they want service there, and then they'll slide in notes to the bathroom about the most vile racism and white supremacy Again, I don't even want to repeat the names of the stuff they said, all the kind of... You can imagine. You, use your imagination. The stuff they wrote. They would slip in there. Just to fuck with people. Just to be nasty. They're cowards. And they would love to be executioners. They would love to be in power. And it was only a couple times, more than a couple times, really, the groups of, like, you know, white supremacists you've seen in the news would come in. And a lot more times, it was just people who, that's just their mentality, their culture. It's not they were explicitly that way, but it's weird how much that, that clash would happen, not with physical violence in there, but just the way, you know, I would watch out and how to navigate around people. I saw guys doing Hitler salutes close to the, to this day, I hate saying, it makes me so fucking angry to see that you bastard, stupid nonsense doing Hitler salutes. One of them was a Latino guy. And uh, man, I, I tried saying something to them the first time. I, they, like, the guy didn't really hear me. He was so fucking wasted. He came back next week. I fucking screamed at him and told him never come back. And, and like I said, again, it was like a lot of the mentality that was just around. It wasn't even like people explicitly white supremacists, just people who bought into the ideas of like, yeah, I hate Black Lives Matter. I hate post, what, posters? P uh, protesters. I hate liberals. Um, you know, if you don't love America, get the fuck out. Which, what does that mean? 
America is, uh, like if you criticize racism, you're criticizing America. Um, people who, you know, real assholes about, um, basically upholding white supremacy. Fuck protesters, fuck Black Lives Matter, uphold the military as a white supremacist force and the police as a white supremacist force that's, you know, there to bring black people to heal. Um, it's just sickening. So, now, okay, so that stuff happened, and, uh, yeah, I didn't like fighting and stuff. Most part, it was just boring, sad, lonely, and that's what I remember most about it. This five-and-a-half-year hole in my life, not that it was a totally meaningless or empty, like, I had to go through it. I wouldn't change it. But it was just so lonely that I was barely making enough money to live. I moved in first with that shortly after I got these jobs with the uh, 89-year-old Baptist pastor who wanted to get in the shower with me. Then I moved into the shithole of Annandale for two years. Hated every second of it. Was miserable there. Then I moved into my house in Arlington where I just hated my roommates because I can't stand people who just want to feel good, just want to party, enjoy themselves. I, I don't get that. I can't be like that. Part of that is, I guess, it makes me so ashamed to be like that. Like, And also, it makes me miserable. I, w I don't enjoy it. One thing I didn't like at the bar, and it's not like I ever said anything, but, you know, I was always nice to people about birthday parties. They would have them there, or celebrations or whatever, and I'm like, this sickens me. How can you just indulge yourself and just want to celebrate and feel good when there are people suffering? When I know there are people who won't live another day who are so miserable and such excruciating pain, and I want to celebrate myself? I would be so ashamed if I celebrated my birthday. I swear I'd have to fake my own death just to like hide from the shame of it. It would be so embarrassing. How could I do that when there are people struggling? I don't get that. And bring other people like you. You celebrate me too. How can I do that? A much better use of my time? Just keep working? Keep doing stuff that's like, you know, motivating to others? And, and kind of point out the hypocrisy of that. I always pronounce hypocrisy poorly. Um, same with other celebrations, whatever, work ones. So I don't get that, but also I'm kind of a loner. So I, I, I do not like being around groups of people like that and having them celebrate with me. It just makes me feel so uncomfortable, so weird. I always like a little conflict, a struggle. I like to be working. And that for me was just so lonely because I was working basically four nights a week. There was a time six months where I was working about seven nights a week. One night off every two weeks because I was between I was doing two bouncer jobs just to pay my bills, pay the rent, pay my car payment. And uh so lonely because I was broke, depressed, miserable, um, so hurt over a lot of things. You know, I was just getting out of that nine months of disability. And that, on top of the memories of all the, you know, other stuff that I was coping with. And that was, you know, also like all sort of wrapped into the nine months of just disability and just uh, misery I was in. And I was absolutely sure I'd never be well again. And after those nine months, I was out of shape. I gained a bunch of weight. Um, I was up to like 200 pounds, which I think I was probably hovering near recently. I think I'm losing weight now. And I am able to work out now again, finally. My ribs are still a little hurt, but they're not being hurt by the workouts. And I'm avoiding, if I feel I'm starting hurting, I stay away from that motion, just whatever it is really specific that does that. But um, I was so out of shape. The first night I worked at my job, I just stood there and I was breathing hard. My heart was beating. Um, and I, I was really bad at working out for a long time. I, mean, I didn't know how to commit myself to it. I'd do these cheap, like, wimpy little workouts that were not very effective for a long time. And I just didn't know. I didn't get the mentality of just focus on it. Have your mind in the workout. And it took going to the gym to realize how to really push myself to do it. I'm also getting up early and doing it too. So the other thing, not only working late, just sad, lonely, not involved with, you know, much that other people did. Um, having my nights taken up, couldn't be out at movie stuff. Uh, not much going on during the day. I was so broke. Um, and also just it made me miserable waking up late every day. And uh, my day starting so late. Um, I didn't realize how miserable that made me. Now I realize the value of getting up early. I try and get up 5.30 every day, and maybe I get up a little later sometimes, but 
it's sometimes really hard for me to if I go to bed late. But I try to go to bed by 10 o'clock now. That's pretty good. But I can sleep like a motherfucker. I can sleep 10 hours. So really, if I wanted to sleep 10 hours, I would go to sleep at like 7 at 7.30 at night. And uh, wake up at 5.30, right? Does the math work out on that? It's just sad. It was just a lot of time, a lot of, you know, it was like a long grind of emptiness and I didn't want to tell anyone what I did at work. I kept to myself once in a while when people would try and talk to me. I didn't want to say anything. I didn't have anything to relate to with people. I didn't, my mind was not in that stuff. My mind was in movies. Um, and that was one thing I was thinking about relating to the Jackie Chan book too. He said how he was stuck with his parents in Australia for a while after he had been a stuntman for a little while and the movie industry collapsed in Hong Kong. Uh, after Bruce Lee died, or at least the martial arts stuff, um, started doing really poorly, and he was out of money, and he was, uh, he, he wasn't, he said he was, you know, he wasn't a great guy either, he was gambling a lot, doing a lot of, and not that I put that down, it's just like, you know, know the consequences of what you're doing, but basically, it was like, there was nothing else I had, nothing to live for, risking my life every day for a little bit of money, so we'd go gambling, go to prostitutes, whatever, he said how even in Hong Kong, he's like, well, I could work here in a kitchen and uh, just keep working, but he always kept wanting to come back and make movies and do martial arts, and he could never get that out of him. After the 10 years, too, of intense training, uh, getting up at 5 a.m. every day to train and uh, going to sleep at 11 o'clock at night now under a brutal master who would beat him and beat the other students, and they were constantly starved if they messed up. And uh, he said he just always wanted to go back to martial arts. So that's kind of what I was thinking too, is like even at, at the, my job as a bouncer, I always wanted to go back to movies. I always wished I could have been working on films. And it was a little hurtful, so I could just never bring it up to people. I didn't want to talk about it. I couldn't be myself. So it was so sad. Um, just keeping my, I, the, the conversations that were going on around me, they were not the conversations that I wanted to be a part of. Just about ordinary stuff, everyday, whatever. So um, it was just painful, lonely, and after a while I, I grew less and less tolerant of it. And that's just how I get with things. Like I, my tolerance grow, goes down, then I have to do something. I have to make a change. And uh, I couldn't take work in there anymore. I moved into my car October 31st, 2018, and by, I think, was it April, I believe, I quit my job, 2019. So after a while I just had no tolerance for it. And part of it, my ears were hurting so much anymore. I can't believe the garbage music people picked out to play there. Uh, I don't get it. Like, I seriously couldn't get it. It was like the music, it's like, oh, it's like people pick music. It's like, oh, it's not a good song. It's just interesting. Like, you wouldn't want too much good music. It's just got to be an interesting sound. Just unpleasant shit I'd never heard before in my life and I never want to hear again. And it stressed me the fuck out. Not that I was constantly so stressed. It just... Uh, I, I would just tune out and not listen to songs. Um, and uh, I don't get, like, people would play boy band music from the 90s, and I'm not putting the people down in those bands, but I'm like, I thought all those songs were, like, so dated, and, and people made fun of it or laughed about them. And it's like people would go up and sing them. I'm like, is this to be ironic, or do they actually like it? Um, so I was just constantly hating myself there because I could not be myself, no matter how much... I was a bouncer, I, it was not me, it could not be me. I was always just trying to make myself be one. I enjoyed being around some of my coworkers. Hey, it's the longest I've ever held a job, five and a half years. Before that, I could only hold a job almost two years before I would quit. And uh, each job, I just got to the point where I just got sick of them, I couldn't do them. And this one, fortunately, it did allow me to do stuff sort of, you know, during the day that uh, you know, it was film related, but it was hard. Even getting up to go to my mom's house to shoot videos at 1.30 in the afternoon was hard for me. And uh, also, it was just too much comfort in a way. I didn't need to push myself to live in my car aside from I was being bro going broke. And I just hated my roommates. I hated how they were just constantly, like just everything is just about pleasure seeking. Nothing inherently bad, um, but just watching TV, hanging out, I'm like, this is not, I cannot stand, I don't want any of these thoughts infecting my thoughts. And it's so weird being close to people in close quarters, like you know each other's every move, you know, you know, their routine, 
you know what your differences are. So it, in a weird way, it feels like any wrong move can be like a death struggle or or the other person's worrying that it's gonna be a death struggle. And I don't like that either. Like nothing could just be casual. It's like, oh, any little thing, any movement or whatever, it made me tense. Like I didn't want people to know what I was doing because I was constantly worried. People would say, oh, you're being bothersome or something. And it just sucked. It was terrible. I, I hated it. Um, it was a comfortable place, but meant nothing to me. The comfort meant nothing. So I'd rather be doing what I am now and sort of pointing out the hypo hypocrisy. I always mess that up. Hypocrisy of that, of just wanting to live comfortably. And I, I have nothing. But it's weird. I don't want people thinking it's like this, you know you know, these two lives in direct opposition when I'm that close to someone living with them. But ultimately that's kind of what it felt like. So I had to leave. And you know, that's what I said. Like I can't be around people like that in those quarters. Um, there were a lot of nice customers there. Uh, there were a lot of cool people at the bar, people who I enjoyed seeing every week, who were a lot of fun to be around, you know, um, spent a ton of money there. I don't know how they did it. Man, these people had to have a lot of money. And it was kind of disappointing to me. It's like, why spend all your money just going out and drinking? But what did I care, you know? I was working there, so it was cool to have them there, you know? They were supportive of me. It was nice to know that people were there that, you know, were looking out for me, had my back. And sometimes they would, you know, jump in for me and help protect me from people. Uh, so, and other times it was bad, scary stuff. It was one night, now I was not there for this, but it was a guy I know, another fucking mean, nasty guy, and he encountered another mean guy who I knew, and uh, they got into some argument apparently, and the one guy decked him, and, um, and laid him out on the floor, and his head hit the floor, and he went into a coma for like three weeks, and the guy, the, the other guy, was must have been scared, and um, you know, worried about police charges and stuff, and ultimately they didn't charge him because there was like one little blind spot in the camera where it couldn't see exactly what started the fight or the punch. But um, the guy who went in the coma, he ended up getting out of it, and last I heard is he was recovering. I don't know how full his recovery was, but that shit's stupid, man. It's for fucking nothing. And the guy who punched him didn't learn anything. He kept coming back. After a while, he, he didn't come back for like six months or something but then he started coming back and if it was up to me I wouldn't have let him back but the owner wanted to owner knew him a long time so I disagreed with that and the guy didn't learn shit he was still you know mean guy um and I just can't stand that culture that mentality of fuck everyone of white supremacy of anger domination hostility this southern you know angry, mean um, attitude a lot of guys had there, and uh, just made me sick. I was fed up with it. But it wasn't really just that. It was just the hours, the taking away from my life, the noise, the hurting my ears, and finally got to the point where like, I can't take this anymore. I'll take my chances just making YouTube videos and trying to get film work, which was very uh, hard to come by. It was a lonely time, this big hole in my life, but not a complete hole. It's like, it was necessary to get to where I am now, so I wouldn't change it. I am glad as hell I'm done with it. So that those are some stories, some of my experiences and feelings from being a bouncer for five years. I did also learn really how to interact with people better because it's all it was better to interact with someone if there was a potential fight at the bar than at home because at home it's like everything can be a near like you know it's like oh it's like taking offense to their whole life but at the bar it's like we already know what it is you know we know we're out i try to be nice whatever it is usually most of the time i'm capable of talking people down or whatever most of the time people aren't even trying to fight a lot of what i did really i forgot to mention this because it was so routine a lot of what it was is if someone puked, clean up after it, tell them they got to pay their bill and go. I wasn't mean to them about it. Just like, yeah, I know. He's, yeah, you say your friend's okay, but we don't allow people to throw up in here. People would say, no, no, no. I'd always say like, okay, friend's got to go or whatever. They can't, you've had enough to drink. They're like, no, 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 he's fine. It's fine or whatever. Or she's fine. Uh, and the thing is, they're thinking like, yeah, as long as they're not dying, they're fine. But I'm like, no, no, no. We don't allow people to get to this point. Once they've had this much to drink, uh, they they got to go sober, sober up. That's it. 
but it wasn't being rude about it. it was being that sometimes I'd help walk them out if they couldn't walk out you know uh, sometimes getting little arguments but I always try and be respectful and then when they if they came back they'd apologize or they might not remember or say they don't remember but I can believe sometimes they didn't remember um, a lot of times you know just people starting to pass out and just waking them up and if they didn't wake up say okay look you got to go outside and it was tough to deal with that shit because you know especially if it was someone a lot bigger than me how the fuck am I going to force them to go out I would get my either bigger coworker who didn't mind being stern with people who's a lot bigger than me get him out or if I was there by myself you just kind of kind of have to let it go or whatever I had to do I don't know it didn't come up too often but you know people cuz we were careful about how much we serve people you got to be responsible for that but it happened you know regularly enough and you don't know what people's tolerances are or what they had to drink before they came there they might have just had a drink you know across the street and then come right over and you don't know they've had anything to drink yet so, uh, anyways, there's my stories about it. Uh, I was just thinking about it so much today. It's like I had to get it out of me. I had to uh, get these stories out. I was just obsessed with them this morning, thinking about them so much while I was working out. And I was glad to be working out again. Uh, so, although, I'll be glad to be done going to the gym, too. Just obnoxious people playing music on their cell phones in the locker room. And that's kind of it. <laughs> I don't know. That bothers me the most. And the music in the gym. I just fucking hate I despise the pop music that plays there. All right, everybody, you wanted some stories? There you go. That's stories that I just, I had in me and I was thinking about so much and I just need, they needed to get out. Um, so there you go. Like, subscribe, all that stuff.